Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. I am so glad that you joined me for another episode of the podcast. I hope you're enjoying the show and that you're telling your friends and your family about it. Do you belong to a genealogy society? Well, for goodness sake, I hope you'll tell the president and the newsletter editor about the website and the podcast and encourage them to announce it to your group. The more the merrier, don't you think? And remind them to subscribe to the free newsletter. It's a great source of content for society newsletters. You know, it's a tough job editing a society newsletter every month, and sometimes you just need a little extra help. Well, your group is welcome to reprint portions of my newsletter as long as they add a footnote referring to me and the newsletter as the source. I'm glad to be of help. So I hope you'll pass that along. Now, from the Genealogy Gems mailbox this week, I have a lovely note from Diana Larson. She writes, I'm fairly new to both genealogy and to podcasts. I have been very fortunate when it comes to both areas. I've been blessed that my family has given me the large collection of old photographs and treasures that date back several generations, in some cases back to my great-great-grandparents. And I'm lucky that I stumbled across your podcast on the iTunes store. Not only have I subscribed to the podcast, but I have all the episodes downloaded on my iPod. I listen to you during my hour-long commute to and from work every day. Wow, that's a long commute. I'm glad to be there with you. So far, she says, I have only been able to listen to the first seven podcasts, but even so, I love them. First off, let me say a big thank you for including the link to Anna Corinne's Swedish American Genealogy Podcast. You're welcome. My father's side of the family came to the U.S. from Sweden, so this is right up my alley. I also wanted to share a couple of photographs with you, she says. During your third episode, you talked about creative ways to display your family history treasures, and I wanted to share with you something absolutely wonderful that my aunt did for me. When my grandmother had to downsize and move into an assisted living facility, my aunt stumbled upon a beautiful silk baby dress and a pair of leather button-up baby shoes that had belonged to my grandmother. She had these framed for me, along with a photograph of my grandmother on her first birthday wearing them. She gave the finished product to me because she knew how much I am fascinated by our family's history. I look forward to listening to and learning from the rest of the Genealogy Gems very soon. Thanks again for such a wonderful podcast. Sincerely, Diana Larson. Well, thank you, Diana, for such an encouraging email. I really appreciate it. Diana emailed me two wonderful photographs. And you'll find them in the episode 22 show notes. The first one is going to make you go, ah, when you see the adorable face of her grandmother, Eleanor May Lees, on her first birthday, July 25th, 1914. And the second photograph is of the gorgeous framed display that's holding the photo, the dress, and the little shoes. I can really see why it's a showstopper at her house. She really hit the nail on the head about how pieces like this can be real conversation starters. If a display like this sparks a conversation with total strangers who come along into your house, imagine it, how it could lay the groundwork for a wonderful in-depth family history conversation, you know, the next time Great Uncle Howard comes to visit. And Diana mentioned the Anna Corinne's podcast. It's really a treat for those of us with Swedish ancestors. Anna Corinne um, can be found in iTunes if you search under genealogy um, in the same listing as you'll find Genealogy Gems podcast. And um, she hasn't had a new episode for a while, but uh, don't fret because I've spoken to her recently and I know that she's working on a new one. And I'll have a link to her podcast also in the show notes. Thanks again, Diana, for sharing your story and your photos. I know they're going to be inspirations to everyone who's listening. I also got an email this week from Barbara Murphy of Hop Hog, Long Island, New York. And she says she loves listening to the podcast while doing her daily walk, either in the neighborhood or on the treadmill. Good for you, Barbara. Like I said, if I could just find a way to exercise while I'm recording the podcast, then we will all be in better shape. <laughs> but she writes, on this week's episode 21, you were talking about writing your memories. 
I received a book from my daughter last Christmas that does just what you were talking about. It's called A Mother's Legacy, Your Life Story in Your Own Words. And as a side note, I will have a link for you to that book in the show notes as well. She writes, I think it is terrific because there was no way I was going to write anything anytime. We can all appreciate that, can't we? This book is a month by month calendar book. Each month has questions to write about, probably about 30. A sampling of the questions are, what was your favorite pastime as a child? What kind of car did your family drive? Were you proud of it or are you embarrassed by it? And why? Describe a perfect summer day. I have it right by my computer, and when I'm downloading podcasts to my iPod, I answer a couple of questions. Amazingly, I am up to August, she says. I thought it would take a couple of years to do the whole book, but it really gets you thinking. I've even given one to my sister who just gave me that look when she opened it. <laughs> We've all seen that look, haven't we? Uh, she says, I'll check with her soon to see if she actually wrote anything at all. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you, Barbara. I appreciate your email. What a great idea using the time while you're downloading podcasts to make a few entries into a memory book. We never seem to have enough time or think of sitting down and filling out an entire book, but a little writing each day or each week could really add up. And I can totally relate to this situation with your sister. I gave a grandmother's memory book to my mother-in-law shortly after my first daughter was born. Now, you know, the one who just got married this year. <laughs> and she and my mother-in-law returned it to me, completed last year, 20 years later. Now, I, I will say I am totally thankful that she did it at all. But it was a really long wait. I think sometimes people just don't realize how much it's going to mean to the person who receives it. But books like these are wonderful, and my daughter and I just love reading through Grandma's memories. It's a priceless treasure now to our family. Now, both of these lovely ladies who wrote me this week mentioned iPods and iTunes in their emails. They are certainly gaining in popularity, and coming up in today's gem, I'm going to talk about how to turn that iPod into a family history tool. There's a good chance that since you're listening to this podcast that you own an iPod. Now, of course, I'm sure many of you listen through your computer. And it used to be that pretty much only teenagers and 20-somethings owned iPods. Well, times they are changing. And according to a study conducted by the nonprofit Pew Internet and American Life Project, as many as 22 million American adults, or about 11% of the population, own iPods or other MP3 players in the United States. In fact, the iPod was the catalyst for my creating the Genealogy Gems website. My husband and my kids gave me a video iPod for my last birthday, and I was really excited about listening to music and watching my favorite t TV shows since at that time I spent a lot of time sitting in the car waiting for my youngest daughter to finish sports practice. Well, one evening I was looking through iTunes and loading music into my iPod when I saw listings for podcasts. I quickly realized that these were free audio shows, and I typed genealogy in the search box, and the rest is history. Well, within a few short weeks, I had given myself a crash course creating a podcast by studying other websites on the internet, and the Genealogy Gems podcast was up and running. Nowadays, you know, I rarely listen to music on my iPod, but rather have a couple of favorite TV shows and a slew of podcasts on a variety of topics that I love listening to. And it seems like everywhere I turn, people I know are popping up with iPods. It's definitely not just a teen thing anymore. But iPods aren't cheap, and it always seems to me that it would be nice if you could get more use out of them. Well, as the gem name promises, I've got a pretty cool way for you to turn your iPod into a family history tool. Back in April 2007, when I was preparing to interview Steve Morse, I started looking at buying a portable tape recorder. And I wanted to get a digital one so that it would be easy to download the audio files and use it in the podcast. I'd actually been thinking a lot about recorders because I also wanted to record some interviews with family members. After doing some research, I discovered that I already owned a digital recorder. 
my iPod. I just needed to buy the right microphone for it. I decided on the Micro Memo High Fidelity Digital Audio Recorder for the Video iPod by Extreme Mac. And I'll have all the information about that in the show notes so you can take a look at it. Now keep in mind that this particular microphone only works with the Video iPod. When iPod recorders first started coming out, it looks like they had some problems, but the Micro Memo has worked flawlessly for me, and the 30 gigabyte video iPod is really well suited for this kind of technology. The Micro Memo snaps easily in, into the connector at the base of the video iPod, where you would normally plug your charger in, and it has a flexible microphone plugged into the side of it, which you can bend at any direction that you want towards your sound. And this little microphone is really smart. When you plug it into your iPod, it automatically puts your iPod in voice memo mode with the option to start recording or to cancel. I don't know about you, but sometimes it gets a little confusing zipping through the iPod menu and you're looking for things. So I love that it starts me off exactly where I need to be. To start recording, you just scroll to select record and you press the center button on the iPod. That's kind of like your enter button. On the screen, you're going to see a digital clock start ticking away, and you just start talking. The, the clock will show you exactly how long you've been recording, and you can select pause at any time, you know, in case some noise comes in or you want to redo it or whatever. And when you're done, you just select stop and save, and your recording will be stored. It's just that easy. And if you want to play back what you've recorded, there's actually a little built-in speaker on the micro memo. You just press the little silver button and kind of hold it down on the front and you can listen without your earphones, which is nice because maybe the person that you've been talking to would like to hear it play back as well. Unfortunately, the playback is a little bit quiet because the speaker's kind of small, but it's more for a quick check to make sure that, the rec that it's recording properly than a way to, to really listen for an extended period of time. But it is a neat little feature to have. Do you remember that um, episode 18 about Colorado history that I did? Well, all of the on-location audio that you heard in that episode, the train whistle, the mine tour, everything, that was all recorded on my iPod. The process for downloading the audio is pretty much the same as other types of file transfers that you're going to do with your iPod. You just plug it in and you open up iTunes, which will immediately detect that you have new recorded voice memos on your iPod. And it will ask you if you would like to download them into iTunes, which means that they're going to then be saved onto your hard drive. Once they're on your hard drive, then you can use the recordings in a variety of ways. You can add it to a video, you could post the audio onto a website, or you can add other audio and music and everything and put it together and you could burn it on a CD if you wanted to. Now let's talk more specifically about the recording. If you have a family interview where you really want to sit down and have a two-way conversation with someone, you might find the single microphones a little bit restrictive, but no problem. What I did was I just unplugged the micro memo microphone from the little unit that I've plugged into my iPod, and then I plugged in a microphone splitter that I bought at Target for like $5. The splitter gives you two microphone jacks so that you can plug in two microphones, one for you and one for the person that you're interviewing. I did this using really inexpensive computer microphones, you know, they, the ones that have the base and uh, it allows you to stand them up on a tabletop and they work great. That way it means that you're not passing a microphone back and forth or moving the iPod around so that it's not quite so disruptive to an interview. You just want your subject to be relaxed and focused on telling their family history to get the very best interview possible. So now you can record anywhere and anytime the opportunity presents itself. You can also record with an external stereo microphone. Just be sure to flip the little switch above the microphone jack on the micro memo unit and switch it up to line. You can also use the line feature to record from another source other than a microphone, like um, your computer or a mixing board um, or a stereo. Just plug the cable into the three and a half millimeter jack and make sure that you've switched it to, to the line mode. And this will allow you to record in stereo direct to your iPod. 
When you're on the road, you never know who you may come across, and this way you have multiple ways to capture audio when you need it. Hmm. I have some old family history recordings on cassette tapes. You know, a little patch cable, I, I could hook that up and I could finally get them converted to digital. See, I'm learning things while I'm teaching you, which is great. <laughs> but your little iPod is even more of a workhorse. You can also store photographs on it. Now, this isn't a feature that's very widely advertised. I know that my kids all have iPods. And they didn't know about it, which is amazing to me, considering all the photographs they're always taking and sharing with their friends. Well, photos are great, but let's expand our thinking here. We're really talking about images. And this could mean census images, letters, anything that could be saved as an image can be stored on your iPod. So now let's think about that and, and go back to our family interview. Wouldn't it be great to be able to show the person that you're going to interview some of the old family photos just to kind of get them in the mood to talk about family history? I'm sure there are countless situations where you've been in conversation with somebody and you thought, oh, I wish I could show them that certain photograph, you know. Well, now you can. You can reach in your purse or your coat pocket and you can show them. So here's the step-by-step -step process for loading images onto your video iPod. The first thing you need to do is create a file folder on your computer hard drive that will hold all the images that you want to load onto your iPod. So here's a refresher on how to do that. You open Windows Explorer on your PC, select the hard drive that you want to create your folder in. From the menu, select File, New, and Folder. And the new folder will appear and the name of the folder will be highlighted and it's ready to name. So let's make it easy on ourselves and we will name it iPod Images and then just press enter on your keyboard. You can also have multiple folders within the iPod Images folder. For example, I have a folder within it called Wedding because in order to brag about my oldest daughter's recent marriage, I have to have my photos to show. And I have a folder called Genealogy, which holds all of my family history images. You can have as many as you want as long as you have the available storage capacity on your iPod. Now you'll want to either scan photos and documents and save them into this file, or you could copy and paste photos or images that are already on your hard drive into the folder. Now once you have everything that you want in the folder, you're ready to load them onto your iPod. So plug your iPod into your computer and open up iTunes. Make sure in that left-hand column on the iTunes main page that you've highlighted devices and the name of your device, like <laughs> mine's called Mom's iPod. You can tell my kids set it up for me. Because um, sometimes you'll, you'll load up iTunes and you'll start off in the store. And it's important that you're in your device mode. So if you look over in that left-hand column, you'll see library at the top, which are all the different... Um, files that you have saved from iTunes onto your hard drive, then you'll see store, which is how you can, you know, browse and find podcasts and buy music. And then you'll see devices. And you'll want to make sure that yours is highlighted. And when it is, you will then have a new window in front of you. And it says iPod. And there's the name of your iPod, what the capacity is on it, all of that. And across the top are gray menu buttons. Click on the one that says photos. Now click the sync photos box that you'll see there on the white page and then click the gray box to choose a folder from your hard drive where you're going to pull your photos from. This will open a window called browse for folder and from there you can find your way to your newly created iPod images folder. When you click on the folder the little folder icon will look like it opens and then just click OK. You're not going to actually see the files that are inside. Now make sure the All Photo button has been selected, as well as the Include Full Resolution button. And you'll see those again on that main white page in iTunes. Now you just click the gray Apply button that's at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. iTunes is now copying all of the photos from your folder onto your iPod. And you'll see that happening in that little box at the top of the screen. You'll kind of see it saving just like it does when it's um, downloading podcasts or music. So let's take a look and see if they're really there. 
eject your iPod, and the main menu will appear on the iPod video screen. And from there, select Photos. Then select Photo Library, and you should see thumbnail images across the screen of all your images. Just use the dial to scroll to the image that you want to view in full size, and you'll know that you have it because there's going to be a yellow line box around it, and select it. The screen will go black for a second or two, don't worry, and then that image is going to pop up and it will appear full size on the screen. Now you're probably thinking, uh, great Lisa, but aren't you stretching it a bit to think that I'm going to be able to read a document on a one and a half by two inch iPod screen? <laughs> I know what you mean. I can't even read a normal size document without my reading glasses since I hit, hit the age of 40. But no worries. You can actually get a six foot AV cable for the video iPod and you can plug your iPod into your television and view images on any television screen. This is a real bonus when you're at Great Aunt Bertha's house and she doesn't have a computer. The cable is super easy to use. You just plug one end of the cable into the headphone jack on your video iPod and the other three plugs into the corresponding yellow, white, and red jacks on your TV. Then you just turn your iPod on and from the menu you select videos, then select video settings, and now select TV out and just click the button until you select on for TV out which means you're going to be sending that signal out to the television. Click the menu button and go back and select the photograph that you want to look at. Or you could even um, watch a video podcast or television show, or even listen to music on your television for that matter, and just press play. You may need to change your television tuner to the appropriate channel to receive the signal. On my TV, I had to actually switch it to input 5. Now keep in mind that older televisions may not have this feature be compatible um, and therefore the cord might not work. But I'm guessing that any television that was purchased in the last five or ten years will probably be compatible. So now you can gather the family around the television set and share your photos and videos in big living color. Why you could even invite your friends over for a family history scrapbooking party and listen to the Genealogy Gems podcast through your television. And here's a fun way to show your photos on the TV to your family. Create a customized photo slideshow. In the Photos menu in your iPod, the first option should be Slideshow Settings. And within that menu, you can set the iPod to show your photographs as a slideshow. And here's how to do it. First, set the time per slide at 2, 3, 5, 10, or 20 seconds per picture. 5 seconds is pretty good for setting photos to music, and 10 seconds might be more suitable when you're showing kind of unusual photos that people really haven't seen before and that they might want to take time to look at more closely. Now you're going to want to select your music to go with the slideshow. You can select any of your existing music playlists, or you can just set it to um, Now Playing, which is going to play whatever songs you have on there randomly. But I kind of like to create a new playlist specifically to accompany the photos. That way you can choose exactly what songs that you want and you could even select your time per slide to kind of coincide with the beat of the music. So if you want customized music to go along with your slideshow, um, just take a moment and get that created on your computer before you set up the slideshow in, in your iPod. Next, set the repeat and shuffle photo settings to off. I made the mistake of leaving these on on and they, it didn't work. <laughs> so make sure they are on off. Now select transitions to choose how you would like the photos to change during the slideshow. I kind of like um, the dissolve transition for more sentimental slideshows and transitions like radical and swirl are for more whimsical, kind of fast-paced slideshows. There's lots to choose from, so just play with it and try it out and pick what you like. Now you're ready to go. Using the menu button, navigate your way back to the Photos page and select the folder of photos that you want to play as your slideshow. When you see the list of the thumbnails and the yellow box is around the first image, you're ready to go, so hit play. The music playing along with the moving photos is really cool. You're going to love it. So consider the powerful little iPod. 
We've dramatically lowered the guilt meter in buying one now that you know just how much family history work it can really do for you. And besides, down the road, when I have finally got some video podcasts published, you'll be able to watch them in living color on your own video iPod. So go to my website at genealogygems.tv for all the instructions and the equipment that I've mentioned in today's podcast. I hope that if you do consider purchasing any of the items that I've talked about today, that you'll do it through links on my website. The links simply tell the, the vendor, such as Amazon, who referred you to them. The price is the same, and all your personal information only goes to that vendor. I don't see it or none of it is sent to me. But by getting to the vendor through my website link and making a purchase, you help support the podcast and defer the production costs. So we all win. So thanks for keeping that in mind. My iPod is fun and hardworking. And now I can really hardly remember ever not having one. So whether it's recording a family history interview, making recordings from old cassette tapes, or being able to pull out and show family photographs, or if it's putting together a terrific slideshow and gathering the family around the television to watch it, I think that you're going to find that your iPod does a whole lot more than just play music. So happy listening and happy viewing. That's it for this edition of the Genealogy Gems podcast. Thanks so much for making me a part of your day. I hope you'll take a cue from Diana and Barbara and drop me a line at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com and tell me about your projects, your ideas, and suggestions for the show. And of course, be sure and visit the website at genealogygems.tv. I hope you're enjoying the new format and taking advantage of all the different pages on there. I'm still working on adding lots of content. You're going to find not only the show notes, but you can also sign up for the free monthly newsletter and watch genealogy-related videos and, and lots more. So it's lots of fun. So until next time, I wish you a treasure trove of genealogical gems. And I'll talk to you soon. <music>